Hi, everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Delighted on this episode to be talking with author, comics creator, may, may I say legend? Is legend a word that, that gets used? No, no, <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, Stuart Moore. Stuart, thank you for jumping thank in you. and talking with me. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I could go through the laundry list of titles that you've done. You've worked in comics for some time. You've worked in prose adaptations of comics uh, and comics worlds. I think one of the most recent prose adaptations that I ran across of yours was a book about the Cree um, through Marvel Publications. Target Cree. That's actually an original novel. Yeah. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah. But yeah, I've also adapted books like uh, series like Civil War for them and uh, the Dark Phoenix saga. Mm -hmm. And um, going the other direction, you've also adapted books to comics. I think Batman Night Stalker uh, Night was one, or Night, Night Walker was one of those. Yeah. 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 Um, they just, like, DC just sent me a very nice um, box set of that that I think is out for the uh, for the uh, for the um, Christmas season where they uh, they uh, put it together with the Wonder Woman and Catwoman graphic novels that came out around the same time right, in the same format, which are also really nice. So that's a that's a good little stocking stuff, fat fat stocking stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it, love it. Um, and then you also have Captain Ginger, which we'll come back around to and, and talk about as well. But we could spend the entire episode probably just listing um, several of the things that you've worked on. Um, uh, yeah, it makes me tired sometimes, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so curious about your path to comics and sort of what inspired you to start down this path of creating in this world. Well, uh, I always uh, I always loved comics. I always read them. And uh, um, uh, I'll try not to repeat stories I've told too many times. But uh, <laughs> but when I was um, I was a DC kid, kind of. And uh, then when I was mm -hmm. 16, um, and this is really dating me, but uh, it's before before the real trade paperback revolution, when it was hard to not too many series were collected that way. A friend of mine who I'm still friends with um, sat me down and uh, just handed me all like stacks of all the 1970s, the great 1970s Marvel comics. And that just blew my mind. That just like mm -hmm. blew everything wide open. So I love that stuff. Uh, when I um, uh, when I first uh graduated from college i uh well, at first i didn't know what i was doing um but then i um i got a job as a as an assistant editor at uh, saint martin's press a mainstream book publisher um and i became mm -hmm. an editor there and i specialized a lot in um mostly in science fiction and pop culture books of one kind or another um i did some comic strip collections uh, i did a few comic book related books uh, but no actual comics and um from there i <laughs> i literally answered an ad in publishers weekly uh, because DC was trying to expand the editorial group that became Vertigo a few years later, uh, mm -hmm. that Karen Greer ran. And they were looking for an editor from outside comics who had context with, uh, with writers in particular that they might not. Um, so that was it. That, uh, that all worked out pretty well. And, uh, that's, um, that's how I got there. Um, I, I didn't do a lot of writing while I was on staff at DC, which I was for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Um, they weren't really encouraging that at the time, um, as they still don't, I think, actually. But um, uh, so I, it was one of those situations where I sort of had to leave staff in order to become a full time writer, um, which I did eventually. Um, and it's worked out pretty well since I still do certain kinds of consulting work. Um, I, I do. Um, I handle publishing operations for Ahoy Comics uh, on a free <laughs> basis. Um, so I work pretty closely with them. And that's uh, that keeps my handy with other things and, you know, helps make ends meet, too. Yeah, yeah. Ahoy is. Uh, are they a subdivision of Simon and Schuster? Is that right? Or no, it's an independent. Oh, an okay, independent. okay. Um, it is um, distributed by Simon and Schuster to the uh, to the book trade, as well gotcha. as by um, Diamond and Lunar to comic shops. Gotcha, gotcha. I didn't wasn't quite clear on the the connections there, but um, yeah, I, I enjoy what Ahoy does. Uh, Matt Boers and Ben Clarkson have been on talking about their work, so enjoy that a great deal. Yeah, Matt and Ben's book, Justice Warriors, um, is selling so well for Ahoy through uh, through the book trade, through Simon & Schuster, that I'm having to check their inventory um, every day <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> to, make, there's, uh, to make sure there's enough. And they're literally shipping them out all the time. Um, uh, Matt and Ben have, uh, in addition to being incredibly fun skilled creators uh, matt in particular has a 
he has a sales apparatus through the nibs that uh, that's just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we have to we have to keep up with him, <laughs> which is fun. He's a great guy. He's a wonderful guy. It's, it's very interesting. Like always okay. thinking about new um, new venues, both for selling books and it, creatively in terms of new projects. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Uh, you probably answered this question many times over the years, but I am curious um, what it was like to be sort of on the ground floor at Vertigo, or as I affectionately call them, the comics that scared me as a kid, um, <laughs> in, in the best of all possible ways. <laughs> well, I, I, I take that as a compliment, yes. yes um, absolutely. <laughs> uh, it was amazing. And uh, by the time I got there, um, uh, Karen had sort of started, had really gotten the editorial group going um uh, and 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 the initial books all sort of took off in one way or another from alan moore's swamp thing which mm -hmm. karen had had inherited from len ween and uh and sort of built up from there um uh at the time i got there it's funny i was just writing about this for for, for, uh, for someone else um at the time i got there there was a weird lull going on because dc had had um they'd gotten a lot of attention in the late 80s um, partly for books like um, Ronin and Dark Knight and Watchmen, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Alan, Steve Bissett and John Tuttleman's Swamp Thing. Um, but uh, a lot of that had passed by. There'd been a controversy over um, ratings on the books that had caused uh, some of the top creative people in that list to stop working with DC, at least temp some of them temporarily, some permanently. Um, uh, Swamp Thing itself had gone through a bit of an upheaval when uh, Rick Beach quit uh, near the end of his of his Jesus uh, of his of a storyline because of a rejected issue involving Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, and, and Hellblazer was also coming to a turning point, and that was the second. That was really the second the book that followed Swamp Thing in that line, and that was coming to an uh, to a point where the original writer Jamie Delano was planning to leave um, on good terms. There was no upheaval there but we were worried about the book we didn't know if it could continue and that was where um uh karen handed me both of those books actually <laughs> and said can you do something with these and uh so that was um so i i was sort of thrown into that but we had a lot of other books that were going sandman was just beginning to hit its stride mm -hmm. um and that was of course a runaway success bigger than any of the others um and uh we were doing Shade the Changing Man. We had Animal Man and Doom Patrol. There was a sense we were in. The, we were on the cusp of something. A lot of these were led by what was called the British Invasion of Writers, um, uh, and uh, and in some cases artists. Um, so yeah, it was. Uh, I, I was. I was aware there was something exciting going on. We were all. We were all pretty young. We were all sort of a little cocky about it all. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, it was a. It was a. It was a fun and interesting place to be for sure. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. And um, I want to ask about comics and prose. But before we do that, since we've just talked about sort of the ground floor, um, it might be a good sort of dovetail to talk about Captain Ginger as well. Um, one of your more recent books with June Brigman, Roy Richardson. June, June has been on the show as well and talked a little bit about um, Captain Ginger. So for folks out there, there that might not be familiar with it, any, anything that you would want to share about uh, Captain Ginger or the process behind it? Yeah, let me uh, let me show the cover here. There it the, is. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, Captain Ginger is um, uh, the first book I ever um, I ever created specifically for an artist because I had worked with June before. She's wonderful. She can draw anything. Um, she's great to work with. Um, she and Roy are an amazing team, um, and they've become friends. Um, the uh, the the concept here was was basically cats in space, mm -hmm. and uh, it really was as simple as thinking what would be the perfect thing to do with June. <laughs> and <laughs> I, uh, I think the first person I ran it by was Marie Javens, who is now editor in chief of DC, but had been working with the two of us on a different project before that. Um, and, uh, and she thought it was great. So I just ran it by June, June jumped at it. Um, we developed it ourselves for a, a few years before Ahoy came along. Um, we were thinking about kickstarting it. Um, and uh, one way or another, June gets very busy. She's, she's, uh, she's in demand. Um, mm -hmm. But we did, uh, we, we did two series at Ahoy, both of which are available in trade paperback. Um, and uh, we're doing a two issue series as part of, Ahoy's fifth anniversary 
in uh, November and December of this year. And uh, I'm literally just putting the first of those into production and uh, came out really well. I'm really happy. We got the whole team back. <laughs> it's really wonderful. nice. Wonderful, wonderful. And it's, uh, it's an immersive story and just fun science fiction, really. Well, to me, it's um, it it's it's a half it's half Star Trek and half Cats, and those are things uh -huh. I, those are two things I probably know better than anything else in the world. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't admit, but uh, um, but to but uh, writing is just a very sort of natural experience for me. So uh, so yeah, I'll, I I I'm I'm glad it's gotten um, it's it's been received as well as it has. I uh, I'm I I I would I would write it forever if I could. Love it, love it, um. So that question of what comics allow you to do versus prose and what it's like to go back and forth again, thinking about um, Target Cree and some of the work that you've done uh, sort of on the, the linear left to right 26 characters way of communicating versus words and pictures and design. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a lot um, with uh, uh, I, I always say that um, prose is, um, both exciting and terrifying because mm -hmm. it's all you. Um, mm -hmm. Every word you write, what the reader reads. Um, comics are uh, of necessity collaborative. The other, and you don't want to box the artist in too much. You want to give them room to move. You want to uh, you want them to you want them to bring their own imagination to the page. Uh, the the um, the other two main differences are uh, space um, because you never have enough pages with comics. Um, where prose is much more elastic and much more forgiving and that sort of thing. Um, and point of view, um, because uh, there are exceptions on both sides of this, but um, for the most part, um, comics are, a, a, I, I don't like to say this because people read it the wrong way, but there's some, they're a somewhat cinematic medium in that you can pan around, you can, um, you can change point of view very quickly and sort of move around a, a large cast Mm -hmm. um, where prose is usually much more contained than that. You're usually inside, inside or almost inside the head of one character at a time, mm -hmm. um, which um, can produce an immediacy um, that can be good, but it can also limit what you can do. Um, it can, it can, it it means you have to stage scenes differently. Um, mm -hmm. How much of all that is visible in the end product? Probably not much. And if I do my job right, probably not much of it should be. Um, but um, but that's how I approach it. I, I, I have to, um, when I'm outlining a novel or a novella, which I'm working on now, um, the, um, the structure of it is dictated largely by point of view. Um, like where I, uh, um, who, who's, it, who's at the center of it? Whose dilemma am I dealing with? Um, where in comics, I can, uh, I, can, I can play it faster and looser. Even within a scene, I can shift things around by literally by panning across the room or um or, or changing the angle um so that's a that's that's a short version of how i approach it anyway well, interesting interesting I, i've never heard that description of prose as being sort of the point of view centered um planning but that makes total sense i had to think about it a lot when i was um there was a period when i was um editing and uh commissioning Marvel's own line of prose novels, um, mm -hmm. most of which were adaptations of existing stories. I did Civil War myself. I did, uh, I guess, I think that's the only one I did in that line. I did X-Men later for uh, for Titan, the, the Dark Phoenix saga. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but I had to think of it a lot because I was dealing with a lot of writers. I was dealing with other writers and I had to give them sort of guidelines. I had to give them advice on how to, how to put it together. And I actually came up with a page or two of, um, of, notes that i've never shared <laughs> i've never <laughs> shared with anyone outside that group but uh they were helpful to me in uh in diagnosing problems as well yeah, yeah. that's and thinking especially about dark phoenix that's such a an interesting story to try to tackle in any regard as an adaptation uh, oh, because yeah. there's so many moving pieces there are so many moving pieces it um it sprawled over a lot of issues as well um mm -hmm. and I had to, um, I tried to do what I do when I approach these things. I did this with Civil War to a degree as well, where you look at things that were clearly plotted on the fly in a monthly book. Um, and you think, well, what if I, what if I adjust this? Like in, um, in the Dark Phoenix, it was clear, 
some of this also isn't clear unless you really sit down and read these books in sequence, which is not the way they were, they were designed to be read. Okay. Um, they weren't they weren't written that way. Um, but it's quite obvious in the in the Burn and Claremont issues that they sort of didn't know quite what to do. They brought Professor X back into the story. He'd been out of it for a year or two. And that was to add tension between him and Cyclops. But that wound mm -hmm. up being a little beside the point. Um, and then they suddenly had, by having Professor X there, they had too powerful a character um, on the on the X-Men side as they go up against these unknown foes. So they kept mm -hmm. either writing him out or literally just forgetting about him um, for <laughs> a time. And the issues don't even quite connect. Um, and there's other things like the ending of that story was, um, I'm not telling any stories, but it was notoriously changed at the last minute, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the the big death. And um, it all works. And that's one of the reasons people remember it. There are some elements of it that are challenging from a feminist point of view, if you really look at them. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, also, if you really write it, if, if it, if you have to sit down and write it, um, and you're inside Jean Grey's head, it doesn't quite make sense in a way that you would never notice when it was just rocketing past on a comic page, like when, when you, were, you were reading it like bam, bam, bam. Um, and it's no one's fault. It's because the ending was changed. Um, but that was tricky. I had, to, I had to make some adjustments and figure out for myself, well, what is her plan? Like, why is she, why is she doing what she's doing? Um, so, and the other thing I really tried to do was just flesh her out more as a character because um, Mm -hmm. uh, Jean was uh, Jean was a great device, and it was great. At the, and at the time, it was groundbreaking to have a female character that powerful. But she was never that much of a person, you know. Right. Um, and and I tried to I tried to sort of flesh that up. Anyway, that's all all a big digression. On, oh <laughs> on yeah, the... yeah. But fascinating, fascinating stuff though. And um, yeah, trying to write from a feminist perspective definitely, and, and to flesh that out is is interesting. I'm sure when you but, look back uh, over comics especially to adapt a story that was done over 40 years ago when, mm -hmm. and again, brilliant work by everyone and groundbreaking for the time. Um, but times have changed and, uh, and attitudes have changed. And you have to be aware of that when you do something like this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so curious about anything that we've left out um, that you want to make sure to mention, but also next creative steps, the continuing world of Captain Ginger plans ahead and um, things of that nature. Yeah, I um, I'm a, I, I don't have a lot else that I can talk about. I have a couple of things in one. I have one project that's literally out with book publishers now. I have another project that I might sign the contract later this week. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I can't um, I, I I can't go into any of that. I did just um do something else at Ahoy that's coming out right now. Um, that's uh that's really fascinating. Which is a uh, the Ahoy comics tend to have um. They usually have little short prose stories in the back written by various people to complement the lead um, the lead comics features. Um, and for the fifth anniversary of the company, um, I took charge of and commissioned a 13-part uh, a serial um, by d 13 different writers, including me. Uh, it was kicked off by Grant Morrison, um, and their installment appears in Project Cryptid Number 1, which came out a few weeks ago. Um, and that's coming out now. I think the book out... Um, well, we're, it's again, it's 13 installments that runs all the way through September through the middle of December, I think, in all the Ahoy books. It's called, um, it's, well, the full title is The Annual Cozy, Cozy Detectives Club in Partially Naked Came the Corpse. Um, <laughs> Paul Grant, uh, Grant set, set the whole thing up. But we all had fun with it, and it came together much better than I expected. It's, it's actually a story, um, a mind-expanding one that sort of, grows and billows out in all directions as it goes along but i think we i think we landed at the end too so i'm hoping we might be able to collect that into a, into a single volume at some point it's, i think it's worth it um but that's okay. worth people well i love how you participate as the author but it's also really clear that you think about your collaborators and uh pulling in june and and roy for captain ginger pulling in um, 13 writers, a uh, sort of a cadre of authors, and you can't go wrong if you're leading with Grant Morrison, right? Like, that's... yeah, and we've got uh, Mark Russell, Alex Segura, Torin Grunbeck, um, uh, a lot of really good people involved. That was an interesting project, and I, I it's made me think about what I want to do with my career a little more because, um, 
it's one of the few things I've done that really combines writing and editing. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I liked, I liked being uh, David Hyde or a Hoy's PR guy called me the showrunner of it. <laughs> and that's kind of what I liked doing. And I, I'm, so I'm sort of thinking about what else I could do that uh, along those lines in the future. Love that. Love that. Well, may the journey continue. Um, since you're a Star Trek fan and I know you for writing in that world as well, uh, live long, write long and prosper. Um, and, yeah, and thanks so much for talking with me. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This is great. Yeah, absolutely. A pleasure.